Let onion atoms lurk within the bowl, and half suspected animate the whole. Sydney Smith. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining this, joining me this week. Excuse me. Uh, if you're a newcomer, uh, thank you for joining us, and if you are a returning listener, of course, thank you as well. I really appreciate everyone's support. Um, I am not feeling the best um, since Friday evening. I've had a very bad headache. Uh, and I've been fighting it off and all that kind of stuff. But um, anyway, I am recording this right now on Saturday night. Uh, I'm trying to get this recorded before the Super Bowl and just have a you know a whole evening to watch that tomorrow. So um, due to that and a number of other factors, if this episode's a little bit shorter um, than I would like, I do apologize. Um, but uh, regardless, uh, I'm going to, at the very least, cover a crop that's being domesticated in Europe and a crop that is being domesticated in a couple different places, um, mainly Europe and Asia. But uh, there are some other places it might be, or a variety of it might be um, being domesticated as well. But regardless, um, if, if I can continue, I will get into North America slash Mesoamerica, uh, and then uh, we will continue next week and finish up with the crop domestication in South America. Now, if I can't get to North America, then basically I'm just going to do like a big uh, two-part Americas episode and get through as many as I can in you know, the episodes that we have. So um, I'm going to do my best, so just please bear with me this week. I do apologize. <clears throat> so, uh, to start off this week, we're going to be talking about spelt. Uh, now, you might not have heard of this plant, uh, but it is a rather interesting crop that has a few mysteries hanging around it. Uh, the origin of its English name is one of those. Uh, the English spelt existed in Old English, but where it came from isn't agreed on. Um, most people cite that it came from the uh, late Latin term spelta. However, its origin isn't Latin, and it's not Greek. Uh, the Greeks used the zea for the crop, and that is, or that was the term used for the crop before spelta came into use. Uh, where spelta came from isn't known, uh, but some people believe it came from the Germanic uh, spilt. Uh, this is probably from the Proto-Indo-European word spelled, which means to split or to break off. And spill comes from this, the word spill. Uh, now, if it is a Germanic word, I don't know why Old English wouldn't have gotten or inherited it from Germanic, uh, but I assume that Latin got the name from another Indo-European language and not from Germanic. Um but I don't know that for sure. Uh, as for German, they actually have a couple of words that can mean spelt. Uh, Dinkel, spells, spellsweizen. Uh, for, and for the life of me, I could not figure out which term was older in German. <clears throat> now, regardless of the etymological mystery, there are more uh, interesting uh, mysteries about the crop. That is where this crop comes from, uh, from uh, uh, both uh, genetically and geographically. Uh, now, genetic testing shows that spelt is actually a hybrid of a semi-domesticated or uh, early domesticated strain of what was probably immer. Now, that um, strain uh, spread uncontrolled uh, and combined with a wild variety of wheat. Uh, the, uh, not, a, not a version of wheat that we would recognize, not any that we've talked about, just a wild grass wheat or what have you. 
Now, this hybridization happened around the Caucasus Mountains, uh, though whether it happened on the European or the Asian side of these mountains is uh, spread to the other is debated, um, as is what side of the chain uh, domestication of the hybrid happened. So, um, you know, that it, what I'm, or, or I could probably explain that better. Um, they don't know if this wild crop mixed with the uh, domesticated emmer. Uh, they don't know if that happened on the Asian side or the European side, and then uh, it spread to the other, essentially. Um, or was it um, domesticated um, after it had crossed over, say, uh, was it, um, did it start in Asia, spread to Europe, and then get domesticated in Europe? Or did it uh, hybridize in Europe and then cross into Asia and then domesticate there and then move into Europe? That's all debated. Um, but right now, <coughs> the, uh, the DNA evidence points to uh, the domesticated strains coming from the European side first. Um, and archaeological finds uh, also kind of back this up uh, with the oldest versions of spelt uh, dating to around 5000 BC along the northeast coast of the Black Sea. Today this would be like Ukraine, uh, around uh, Ukraine. So, um, and, and I think the evidence for Asia, Asia uh, the earliest I think it is, is like sometime between 4,000 and 3,500 BC. Uh, and from what I can tell, uh, the plant never really gets that far into Asia, only around areas that kind of border up on Europe. It, it never gets deep into Anatolia. It's really only around the Asian areas of the Caucasus and the Ural Mountains. Um, and even then, it's very scant evidence. Um, now, it does get into Central Europe right around 2500 BC, but that, again, is later. Um, so it's possible that spelt, um, that the spelt that emerged in Central Europe was actually a completely different hybridization event, like a, a, like a domesticated strain of emmer, um, hybridized with another wild wheat and it just created just by you know sheer genetic lottery or chance it it re -evolved, it evolved into spelt essentially uh, these two different hybridization events because the crops that they're hybridizing are so closely related it created a, essentially what is close genetic relative without any direct inheritance which that is very odd but it can happen <clears throat> Of course, now, this strain that does hybridize in Central Europe does eventually come to be mixed with the European, the Eastern European strain of spelt. Uh, and then that combination of these two different spelt strains becomes the dominant version of the crop going forward. And it's this one that will kind of last until uh, modern day. So again... Not very well understood, very highly debated, though it does make sense that spelt would be more popular in Europe, even among groups that migrated from Asia um, with their already domesticated uh, crops. <clears throat> because um, spelt is um, fairly, uh, the hulls in spelt are like the, the covering, the hull, the H-U-L-L hulls are a lot uh, sturdier. Uh, than what you would see in a lot, a lot of other um, grains and grasses. Uh, and this, along with a couple of other factors, make it more suited to cold weather. Uh, it is very similar to rye in that regard. <clears throat> and sometimes they were even grown in the same field. Um, uh, I know rye 
at least according to a couple of ancient authors. I think Pliny the Elder is one that they mentioned, uh, talk about it as well. But he, he thought that um, rye grown with spelt apparently made the rye taste better. And I guess spelt, the rye didn't affect spelt's taste like it did other crops. Um, and this might be because spelt takes a lot longer to grow than some other crops do, especially rye. Um, and uh, I'm guessing maybe the spelt isn't developed enough to kind of get this cross uh, pollination in terms of taste. Um, but I couldn't get a definitive answer on that um, or even how much you can actually really taste the difference. Now, as uh, time goes on, uh, spelt becomes less important for reasons we will discuss later. Um, but uh, today, spelt is only grown uh, in large quantities in a couple of places in Europe and in smaller amounts in other places, uh, almost entirely in Europe and the Americas. Uh, although I think, um, I think I read somewhere that it was kind of becoming more popular as kind of a healthy alternative or a, a more healthy grain. Uh, how true that is or, you know, how much it is people trying to make a trend, I, I'm not sure. Um, but um, the reason I choose to bring spelled up is, again, it's a European crop. Of course, we don't know if it's Europeans domesticating it. Um, and maybe having learned some of the skills from neighbors, from people who had migrated from uh, Anatolia and the rest of the Middle East, or if it was just something that they were starting to kind of experiment with their own. And then they meet later people with much more advanced techniques in terms of farming uh, that kind of made them redouble their efforts. Who knows? So uh, that is something that we'll have to keep an eye on. Uh, for now, though, let's move on to a crop that... Uh, I maybe could have put just in Asia, but I feel like it kind of is a more of a, more like spelled, it's a little bit more up in the air. Uh, and that, of course, is the onion. Or not necessarily the onion, but onions in general. Uh, now, in English, the uh, word onion is actually related to uh, the word union, uh, meaning one, uh, which is from Latin. Uh, which it was unio or unionum, depending on the uh, nominative or not. <laughs> uh, and I believe it's also related to, um, I think the Roman word for pearl is well, uh, well, like a string of onions, pearl onions, that kind of thing. Um, but regardless, uh, that's where it's initially from. Uh, I think the um, there are some other uh, terms for it. Kepa was a Latin word, but that was a that's a loan worm for an unknown language. We don't know where that, that was from, uh, and that's the source of sive uh, uh, in Old French, which is what we would uh, call like a chive, essentially. Uh, now onions probably uh, were first domesticated around. 5000 BC, or at least that's the earliest evidence. It's probably much older. Um, and the primary uh, onion that most of us from, are familiar with, um, or at least the, the one that most of us would think of first, would be um, the Allium Kepa. Uh, and that's what you'll find for um, most, um, most onions worldwide, like you're the most... Um, widely spread variety uh, and that those have three different varieties of course um, brown onions some people call them yellow uh, there's also the red or the purple onions and then you have white onions they're all uh, allium kepa uh, of course in far east asia you have green onions which are a, technically a different species but they're probably being domesticated again around the same time as the um, allium kepa um, there are varieties also in Egypt, um, or what is now Egypt. Um, and there are, of course, um, varieties closer uh, to Europe, um, things like leeks, um, 
scallions, which are onions. I think they finally revised the taxonomy, or not necessarily the taxonomy, but they have agreed that scallions are, in fact, a species of onions and not just a, a close relative. Uh, I think I read that uh, in doing research for this episode. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, now, onions are... Uh, they can be grown uh, twice a year, but I think um, because they're a um, a root vegetable, or at least close enough. Um, no, wait, it wasn't scallions. Sorry, it was shallots uh, that are technically um, uh, onions. Uh, scallions are still their own thing, but they're kind of in that similar similar uh, family. So um, they are. Uh, but they're also kind of around the same time period. Uh, so that's kind of why I'm including them in just kind of a general area and not necessarily one part of Asia. Um, and there are, of course, wild onion species, you know, cousins to the Allium kepum mostly, or what you're seeing when you see wild onions mentioned. Um, but they're grown all over. Uh, most are, again, uh, can be grown uh, twice a year. Though a lot of people who grow them, they'll just harvest them once uh, because root vegetables, vegetables that kind of grow underground like this, excuse me, uh, the longer you leave them in the ground, the typical, the larger they'll get. Um, now, onions do not have a lot of nutritional value, um, but they do have a very strong taste, uh, which is part of the reason they were grown. They were excellent additives to food and to um, other recipes. Another thing that onions are used for quite extensively, or at least their skins were, uh, would be for dyes. Uh, they do make a good cheap dye, especially a good brown or yellowish dye, um, was one of the primary reasons uh, that they were grown. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just reading through my notes, see if I miss anything else um, that I thought was interesting. Um, oh, oils. They can be used as oils for well, uh, as well. Um, though, uh, I don't know how widespread that use of them was uh, in earlier periods. Um, but uh, onions also, interestingly enough, do have some level of religious significance uh, because they are spheres and how they are connected they have those interlocking rings um, they were seen as like a representation of the world by uh, the Egyptians I think in Egyptian uh, religion onions were kind of seen as like a, a metaphor for the world again the Latin Union uh, is related to the word for onion so you know all these rings kind of connected together also kind of had a a, not necessarily a religious function for Roman uh, theology, but more of a maybe a Roman um, a socio uh, socio political uh, explanation. Uh, onions have layers, as it were, as does society, I guess. Um, but that's just kind of a general thing. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, of course, if they make you cry, but that's not. <laughs> I don't think that had any um, any impact necessarily beyond anything else. Um, also, a lot of animals can't eat onions, so uh, I think they would use them um, for to kind of um, in some places it was used to kind of as a deterrent to wild animals to keep them away from other types of food. Uh, yeah, so I think. I think that's kind of everything I had for those two crops. So you know what? It's only. It's only been about 18 minutes, so yeah, I'll go ahead and let's start on the, um, let's go ahead and move in to North America. Uh, let's start with um, uh, squash or, uh, well, in general, let's start with gourds, because uh, I mentioned it, but like the bottle gourd, uh, which has been domesticated in both the Americas and in Asia at an earlier period. Uh, they are technically all cucubrita, which are, um, which is the Latin term for gourd, uh, and that's it. 
the term cucabrita uh, evolved into kind of the old French cord, uh, C-O-O-R-D-E, uh, and that's kind of the evolution to it in English from the old French uh, gourd as opposed to cord. Um, and in the Americas, the uh, cucabritas that are domesticated are squash, pumpkins, that kind of thing. Uh, now, squash, I believe, is the first of the cucabrita to be domesticated in the Americas. Uh, again, they probably had some knowledge of uh, this from you know, domesticated bottle gourds. They probably had a idea that they would be similar, uh, but the cucabritas, the squashes, and pumpkins, things like that, they had a much better flavor, uh, I think, than the bottle gourd. Not that you can't eat the bottle gourd, but I think they have a different uh, flavor profile. Um, now, uh, the English term for squash uh, came from, I believe it's the, uh, yeah, it's the Algonquin word. Technically, it's uh, Narragansett is the uh, sub language uh, of Algonquin. Uh, it was Askutakwash. Uh, and I may, I'm sure I'm butchering that. So to anyone who speaks Narragansett or any other variety of Algonquin that may be listening to this show, please, I apologize very much for brutalizing your language. Uh, but that uh, the squash uh, word um, definitely works well for uh, what you would have to do in some cases to um, cook or to you know eat the squash. You know, you open them up, you kind of get the innards out, you, you kind of make a paste or you add it to other things. So the squash, I'm sure, stuck out to both the uh, any English or uh, French settlers that were interacting with the uh, Narragansett people. So they adopted that term for... Uh, for the the vegetable uh i believe uh askut means uh green or raw and uncooked and asquatch means uh eaten so it's the the green uncooked uh food to be eaten uh now uh, these are domesticated in uh mesoamerica along with several other um plants including maize and these were probably domesticated towards the end of uh, last season actually I just I didn't include them um, but again this includes things like pumpkins um, and uh, again just like summer squash and things like that um, and they're all over they're not just Mesoamerica they are also in the Andes and it wouldn't, again, surprise me if it was being domesticated in a couple of places in the Americas at around the same time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, squash uh, or cucumbers, the various types, they have, uh, they're a good source of both vitamin A and I believe vitamin C too. Uh, most of them have vitamin C. I don't know if all of them do, but vitamin A definitely uh very nutritious um, and again you have a lot of different varieties kind of spread all around uh, zucchinis pumpkins butternut squash all those kinds are all kind of in this family now whether they're all being domesticated at this point in time that's hard to say uh, or you know if certain varieties mix with wild species or you know, once one species was introduced to another region by people, they may have found some uh, wild cousins or ancestors of what they were looking at and decided, hey, let's try to uh, domesticate these as well. Uh, it, it's kind of a hard process to kind of get a firm grip on uh, for someone who is, again, not uh, a biologist or uh, uh, very familiar with... Um, all the species and where exactly they're native to. Uh, but squashes are also good because they grow on the vine and they can continue to grow. Um, and they also have a lot of different seasonal varieties. 
months. So you have a number of these that can be grown at various periods of time during the year. You can leave them on the vine in certain cases. You, you know, if you if you want to, if you have that um, that reserve stock of food that you don't necessarily have to harvest them early, you can let them ripen, grow larger, and then you can harvest them once they get to a size you're you know that's more useful for you or you can you know harvest them early take them with you they're not quite as large they save space that kind of thing so there's there's a lot um, of different uses for um, for squash and things like that um, and in North America outside of Mesoamerica um, squash are one of the big um, big three in terms of crops that are grown by uh, the Native Americans um, along with beans and uh, maize. Uh, and another reason that squash are grown, um, they attract a lot of bees or at least their flowers do. Uh, so, you know, bees coming around pollinating your other, you know, they might be there for um, the squash flowers, but incidentally they're also pollinating other flowers just through kind of contact so they're helpful for other crops in that way um, in fact uh, we'll, we'll go into it when we get a little bit further in the history but growing these three types of plants together is a very big thing in a lot of native agriculture in the Americas all right and uh, let's go ahead and move on to uh, uh, beans um, now, uh, bean is from, in Old English, uh, comes from the Proto-Germanic Bono, uh, possibly Norse Bon, uh, but uh, this is a similar word is used in a lot of the Germanic languages. I think Latin's used fava, F-A-B-A, for which you, as you might guess, we get fava bean, fava beans, excuse me, that's an old world term. Uh, the Greeks used phacos. Uh, I believe they're related, uh, but f uh, in Greek that went more of a lentil, which that's kind of one of those early legumes I talked about um, with the the old world agriculture. I think it was last season. Uh, but the ones grown in North America, you'll find that there's a couple different varieties. Um, now I I think I touched on this when I was going over the Americas. Uh, but initially it was thought that there were two different uh, origins for beans, uh, one in South America, one in Mesoamerica. Um, but I think now the genetic evidence is showing that, well, no, it looks like it may have been domesticated uh, first in the Mesoamerica area, and then some of that got taken south, and then that interbred with a lot of wild varieties in or hybridized with a lot of wild varieties in South America and they formed two distinct lineages from that point on. Um, the ones that we're most familiar with um, just beans, common beans, um, the Latin or the scientific name for that is Facilos vulgaris. Um, these are the ones that you're probably most familiar with if you were to look at them and see. These are the ones that grow up the trellis. Um, and grow up um, stalks and things like that. Uh, there are of course many varieties, uh, but that's the big one that you'd find in the Americas. Um, the North America, excuse me. Um, however, there is another type of bean uh, that is grown in Mesoamerica in the drier climates, and that is the um, uh, Phospholus octifolius. Uh, and this one is it's a little bit more suited to uh, drier climates. So you see this out in the drier areas of uh, modern Mexico, the American Southwest, what have you. And they're, they're all descended roughly from the same source in Mesoamerica. Now, um, how old the Octopholis uh, is, I'm not sure. Uh, also, you might sometimes hear these called as tapere beans, um, and uh, 
I'm not sure, you know, again, how old this is comparatively to the common bean, but it, it is probably, I would guess, coming about at some point during this season, or at least its ancestors are. Um, the name for this is actually from a, um, uh, a native language, uh, Tohono O'Dam, uh, and it's uh, Topawi uh, is the is the word that to, uh, Tepare beans are from. Um, and it actually means uh, it's a bean, Tepawi, uh, it uh, bean Pawi. Um, and there are parts of northern Mexico, I think, where it was called Tapar. Um, but uh, that's kind of hard to to nail down because the language it is spoken of is extinct. It's the Udebe or Apata language, which was like a, I think an Aztec dialect, I believe. <clears throat> so um, that's kind of what we have so far for North America. Uh, episode right now is around around a half an hour. Um, we still have a crop to discuss here for Mesoamerica, and that of course is corn. Um, but, and, well, that's the primary crop we have left. We have a couple of others, I think, uh, to this area, uh, that I want to go into, but, um, I think I'm going to call the episode here. Uh, my headache is starting to get really bad again, and looking at my screen here is really hurting my eyes, so I'm going to go ahead and call it. Uh, we'll be back next week. We will continue on with corn or maize. And uh, then we'll continue uh, into South America after that. And then my goal is to finish up um, the Americas uh, next week. Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to do it, but I'm certainly going to try. And then we'll move on to animal domestications for this season. And then we have a couple of other kind of bonus episodes Um and then, uh, yeah, that'll be it. And then we'll get to the history. Um, and we have some really exciting stuff to go over this season. So I hope you're all looking forward to it. And I hope you've all enjoyed. Um, please uh, like, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to email me at waradrevpod at gmail.com. You can, of course, comment on any of my YouTube video links. Um, drop the subscribe there if you aren't already and uh, I'm also available for direct messages on Twitter so I really appreciate you guys listening to the episode and I hope you enjoy and will listen again next week so thank you all I hope you have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your week goodbye